today is part two of my science series. I promise it's going to be fun. Today we're going to talk about quantum mechanics. All right, now we have to start sort of going back in time a little bit and talk about some observations that were made. And this is sort of sets the stage for why some theories were developed and what those theories mean. And I promise you, it's going to be really fascinating. All right, so first things first, people were trying to decide, is light a wave or a particle? You probably remember that in school. And so what they did is they shined a light on a slit and they let the light project through onto a screen. And what they found is when they shined light onto that single slit, they could see a diffraction pattern form on the screen. Now the diffraction just means as the light goes through the slit, it diffracts off the edges, right, of the slit, and you end up sort of with a wave-like pattern that generates something like that, a very bright area in the region in the middle, and then some small little lobes. And so that gave people um, some indication that maybe light wasn't just a particle, because you think if it was a particle, you would just end up with a single bright beam, none of these little side lobes. So they thought, oh yeah, it's probably a wave then, but let's do one step further. Let's go on to a double slit experiment. That will really answer it. All right? So they shine light onto two slits now, and indeed you get waves that come through both, and those two waves now, they interact with each other after they pass through the slits to form constructive and destructive interference, right? Where they add up in some places, they subtract in places, so you end up with these well-spaced uh, uh, well spaced interference pattern on the screen, okay? So these little bright areas fall in between there's little dark regions, all right? Very uh, well repeated, lots of people have done this experiment. You could do it at home. I bought a little kit from Amazon for like 19 bucks that has all this in it with a little po light laser pointer and everything. It's fun to do just to see the interference pattern form. So, okay, fine. Then we're done, right? Because light is now a wave, we accept that. Well, not so fast, all right? As time went on, they figured out a way to release photons or electrons one at a time, right? Individual photons, individual electrons. And when they release those through the slit, they see a bright dot form, all right? Well, that's weird because that means that this must act like a particle, right? Individual photons come through, strike the screen, and just create a brighter and brighter spot as they get through the, the slit. Okay, so there, that's where we came away saying, oh, light has wave-like particles, uh, wave-like uh, characteristics and particle-like characteristics, right? So you often hear that, and that's because of these experiments. But that's not what we want to talk about. We want to talk about a little bit deeper. When they took the individual photons or electrons and they did the double slit experiment, what would you expect to see? Well, you fire a photon, it's going to go through one of the two, and you're going to form a bright spot. Fire a photon again, it'll go... One, so you should get, if you're, if you're thinking of the particle-like, like in this case, two bright spots, right? Where, you know, they go through the different slits at different, different times you fire it, but you don't get that. In fact, what you get is an interference pattern, very similar to the double slit experiment with the wave. Now, let's think about what that means. The only way to get interference is if two things are interfering after the slit, okay? But I'm firing individual photons and electrons. This one will have already settled onto the screen long, long before the next photon is fired. So how in the world could we be building up an interference pattern? Everybody starts scratching their head. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, individual photons are creating an interference pattern. Not, nobody could quite jive that. So did another experiment. This is where it really got freaky. They now fire those same individual electrons or photons at the double sled, but now they put in a little device that can observe which slit the electron or photon went through. Uh, that great idea, right? Now we'll know what's happening here. As soon as they put the observing system in, the measuring system, it immediately settles to two bright spots, just as if you only went through one or the other and you got a bright spot from do having done so. Now let's think about that a minute. The only difference between these two experiments was the addition of an observer, all right? And that got people freaked out, all right? People started wondering, how is it possible? And the first thinking was more of like a philosophical thinking, well, you know, humans are, di are unique in the universe, and by I or our observing something, we're causing the universe to be different in some way. So it is physically our observation, human's observation, that's causing this. Now, that, that's a pretty good reach, but it was a theory. But that, that people have since moved away from that exactly because there are lots of questions. Well, whatever, it wasn't a person, but it was a cat, you know, and on, on and on, right? Um, so... So that no one really had a great answer, but multiple theories have been developed to try and explain this. And all are mathematically intensive, all basically support all of the data. None of them have fundamental flaws that can just be thrown out entirely. I want to talk briefly about those four, and then I want to talk about the one I like the most and why I do and what it means. Okay. So 
first one was called the Copenhagen Interpretation. And this just came out, that name came out because everybody gathered in Copenhagen, all of the really bright people, you know, the famous scientists you've all heard of, right? Einstein, Bohr, all these famous people. Everybody got together and said, hey, let's figure out what's happening here. And they came up with kind of a hodgepodgey sort of solution. A lot of people didn't like it when the conference adjourned. But basically they said the system is in superposition. In other words, this photon or, or electron is really in a superposition of going through both slits at the same time. And it's only when it's observed that it's forced to choose one or the other. And once it's observed, it's forced and it's a single particle and it strikes the screen. Okay, now there's lots of reasons they had for this. They said that the observing system was large enough, it was macroscopic, and so it had its own behavior and that caused this thing, um, the superposition to sort of be um, uh, resolved as it went through and you had to pick one screen or the other. But there was lots of questions like, well, how big does the system have to be to cause this? What does it mean to be observed? Um, and so, the, and this is still taught in schools, Copenhagen interpretation, that's probably the, the number one thing you see in textbooks. But there's still a lot of questions about it. It seems a little bit um, like a little bit of piecing together of different theories, and there were a lot of questions left unanswered by it. So other people came up with other theories, and all, again, all of these have been well vetted. One of them was the pilot wave theory, which basically says that, part, that light and electrons and, uh, and even atoms and other things are essentially particles that are guided by these pilot waves, like these waves with a particle riding it, all right? And they could use that to explain kind of what was happening in these experiments as well. Now, this one didn't take off um, with the same, the same gusto as the Copenhagen interpretation, but it is something that's still being studied by people. Um, the third one is the hidden variables theory. Now, this is the one that Einstein was in favor of. And he basically said, you know, I don't like this whole randomness of the world being in this superimposed state where there's just some random chance, you know, essentially that it's going to go to one or the other, that the whole universe is sort of, a, there's a lot of randomness and probability to everything. And so he famously had a quote saying, you know, that God doesn't play dice with the universe. Well, you know, that, that essence of the world, the world has to be more, you know, definitive in terms of how the physics is to be resolved. And his idea was just simply we're missing something, right? There's something we're not accounting for. There's some interaction, some variable, something that we're missing. Maybe it has to do with gravity, because gravity is not entangled into this, but there's something we're missing, all right? Now, you would think that would be, everyone would just gravitate to that, because this is just so odd that that would be the, the way, but we haven't found anything missing yet, and so it, it actually is not the leading theory, even though it's sort of tempting to just fall into that camp. And finally, the fourth one, which I think is by far the most interesting, is called the many worlds interpretation. And here's what it says. It says in a nutshell, if you have a, let's say a photon, the photon is in some state of superposition, meaning it could, it could be traveling through one slit or the other slit, and it isn't the fact that you observe it that causes it to, quote, decohere, in other words, make its choice and settle into one state or the other. It's the fact that the observing system is a macroscopic system. So anything you put in there is bigger than a subatomic particle. It's going to become entangled, meaning everything around this, this item, this object that's measuring stuff, Electrons are going to hit it, photons, air molecules, everything. it's going to become entangled with the universe. It's entangled with the universe, and when the subatomic particle, uh, um, essentially, which is in superposition, interacts with it, it also decoheres, and that means it also takes its one particular state. It settles into one particular state just because it decoheres as it entangles with that observing device. Now... That's kind of tempting, all right? But what comes out of that is really fascinating. If you look at the equation, the called the Schrodinger equation, that describes how these subatomic particles move and interact, it predicts that every time this decoherence takes place, in other words, a super, something in superposition settles into one state or the other, in fact, it settles into both. You don't get to throw away half the answers, you get to keep both answers. And so if you're going to go through one slit, well, you also got to go through the other slit. And so you get two cases, one where you went through each slit, and that creates two parallel worlds, one in which you went through the left slit, one that, where you went through the right slit. All right, and so that seems really weird. And that only happens when it's a, 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 some kind of subatomic particle in superposition that has to decohere, right? Well, that decoherence is what causes the split. All right, well, that's really weird. I mean, so what that implies is that every time a quantum decision is made and decoherence occurs, you're going to split the universe into two identical universes, 
where one has one outcome and one has the other outcome. All right, so let's do a fun little experiment just based on comparing the Copenhagen to the many worlds interpretations. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and use quantum computers to help us decide what to have for breakfast. All right, so each time we're going to have the quantum computer make a decision, which means it takes a, uh, a subatomic particle that's in superposition of states, and it's going to force it to decohere and give us either a one or a zero. All right, in the Copenhagen interpretation, remember, it's just the observation that, cause, that, that ultimately uh, causes everything to be a resolved and that observation is what you take as to be reality. So let's say first of all I want to have coffee or tea. I let the computer do a little calculation but before I get the answer I decide if it's a one I'm going to drink coffee, if it's a zero I'm going to drink tea. Computer does its work, particle decoheres, you end up with a one so you decide oh I'm going to have coffee. All right. You should repeat the experiment again. This time you're going to do it for whether to have toast or oatmeal. All right. So you let the computer go again, subatomic particle in superposition, decoheres, this time you get a zero, so you decide you're going to have oatmeal. So by getting a one first and then getting a zero next, you ultimately decide I'm going to have coffee and oatmeal. And that's the end of the story. There is no other universes in which <clears throat> you're having tea and, and toast, okay, or something like that. Simple, straightforward, but what happened to all of the other possibilities? In this case, they just did not exist, okay? So it's not strictly following the Schrodinger equation. You're kind of throwing away solutions. Well, the many worlds interpretation is a little bit different. It says, all right, let's do the same thing. Let, we could have coffee or tea, but let's let the quantum decision decide first whether we're going to have one of those two. All right, so the first decision is I could have, so my decision is going to be here, and I could decide to have coffee or tea. Well, so let's say it comes up with a one. I'm going to have coffee. Now, it could have also come up with a zero. I could have tea. Now, the many worlds interpretation both of those occurred, right? But they occurred essentially as soon as the decoherence took place and the, the subatomic particle chose a state, if you will, the opposite state was also chosen in a parallel world, everything else being the same. So in one world, we chose coffee, and then at other world, we chose tea. And we could repeat, repeat that experiment now as we choose toast or oatmeal, and we end up with different four different worlds where we're having four different things coffee and toast and coffee and oatmeal and tea and toast and tea and oatmeal. And all of that's just from these two decisions that were made from a quantum computer, all right? So four worlds were created using those two decisions, all right? And that's called the many worlds interpretation. So it's very different than the Copenhagen interpretation. Now, I like it because, first of all, it's cool, right? But I also like it because it follows the Schrodinger equation. You're not throwing anything away. You're not waving your hands at what's too big or too small to cause this decoherence to take place. The decoherence takes place, period, because you're interacting with a macroscopic system that's entangled with the world, and you don't throw away any of the solutions, all right? Now, what does this do for us? Well, other than just being fascinating, it may help to explain some of the things we're seeing. It's certainly leading to quantum computers. It's leading to things like remote entanglement of particles and things like that. But I like that there's two unique things out there in the world you can do related to this that are kind of fun. The first one is an app you can get for your phone. I have it on my phone, it costs like a couple bucks. It's called Universe Splitter, all right? And all it is, is it has access to a quantum computer and it essentially will cause a subatomic particle to decohere and give you a value, one or zero, each time it does that. It's just a little push of a button and it goes through and tells you, you're in the universe where it's a one or you're in the universe where it's a zero, okay? And people use that for fun things when they're making decisions. For example, I've heard people, they have a really hard decision, and they're like, I don't know, you know it's 50-50, I can't make up my mind. They'll use the universe splitter, and they'll say, all right, I'm going to just let it make the decision. If it comes up with a one, I'm going this way, and if it comes up with zero, I'm going that way. It lets it make the decision, and it decides a priori ahead of time, that's what I will do. And then it lets the universe tell it, splitter tell it, you're in the universe where you did X or you did Y, and it does it. The person follows that decision, all right? And by doing that, they've in essence created two worlds, if this many worlds interpretation is true, they've created two worlds, one in which they did X and one in which they did Y. And that gives you a sense of, well, even if I made a mistake in the other world, I didn't, and you know, I'm sort of marching along with that other path. So it's a neat way, it's just a decision-making thing that's based on these quantum decisions. Um, I like it, just, it's just fun to do, uh, certainly fun to talk about with people. The other one is, Maybe a little more practical, certainly uh, more intriguing to me. It's called qubit lottery, all right? Qubit is sort of the term they use for a, a superimposed thing that can settle into two states, all right? Superimposed subatomic particle. So qubitlottery.com. And 
what it does is it uses a process of multiple decoherences, in other words, multiple quantum calculations, quantum decisions, in a, in a clever way that arrives at numbers that match up to your lottery number choices, right? So let's say the first number is 1 through 30. It does the calculations and through some binary recursion methods comes up with a number 1 through 30, but only done through quantum decision making, all right? And then it does that for each and every number in the lottery string that you have to enter. And by doing that, if you think about it, for each and every number, you're creating every combination as well that could have been represented. So for the first number, if it's 1 through 30, by doing it through a quantum method, you actually create parallel universes with 1 through 30. All of them are represented in those universes. And the next set of numbers, you do the same thing. So you get this very wide fan. And in the end, you create the universes that precisely match every number in the lottery string. So you have exactly the number of universes as there is lottery numbers, which means that in one of those universes, you, meaning you, your doppelganger, you, either in this universe or in one of the others that you've created by the splitting, is holding the winning number. Guaranteed. All right? So one of you is holding the, the, the lottery winning number. And there's just something really satisfying about that. I, I got one of these numbers as well. And it basically says that if I play this number, I might not win in this universe. I, my chance is no better than anybody else's. But I will win somewhere in one of these parallel universes that were created when I cause those numbers to be generated. And that is just really kind of, there's just something empowering about that. Not only that, but because those people are me, we all have agreed we're just going to hang on to those numbers and we're going to play them. Every time they're played, every single lottery drawing from there forward, someone else in the string will win. So every time those numbers are played, someone wins the lottery. And that someone is me in one of those worlds, which is just a really cool idea. All right. So qubitlottery.com, um, you know, for a few bucks, it might be worth if you're a person who likes to play the lottery, just to have some favorite numbers that you know those favorite numbers were generated by a quantum computer and cause multiple world splitting. All right. Anyway, so two, two interesting applications. So I know I've done a rush job on this whole quantum mechanics. I tried to explain sort of the, what was you know, seen in the experiments, some theories that were used to try and describe it, and there's much, much more to quantum mechanics than this. Um, and I tried to do just a simple example for comparing a couple and what they mean and provide a couple of applications of how to play around with it. All right? But I hope it was interesting, if nothing else. All right, so stay tuned for my third video in the science series. I'm going to talk about shielding, electromagnetic shielding, why it works, do things have to be grounded? How do frequencies matter? All those kinds of things that people are constantly wondering about, right? So stay tuned for that video.